Now let's turn to a much different type of thinker in the Renaissance, Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli is more of a historical and political thinker. In other words, he is also a Renaissance humanist, but he's reaching back into the classical past to recover political wisdom. And he sees politics as the most important thing uh, for humans to pursue. Politics for him is the highest form of, of wisdom. It's the most important endeavor in life and what he, he truly values. Now, let's talk about The Prince. This book is beyond provocative. Machiavelli's little practical guide on political power endures as one of the most read, most followed, and clearly most controversial, controversial books in all of history. He, uh, he writes this book as essentially a little hand guide for uh, attaining political power, but much of what it says is quite provocative. It's possibly the most influential political work ever written, and usually it's considered to be the beginning of modern political science. I want you to click pause right now and I want you to go to Amazon and search Machiavelli. You're going to come up with a very, very long list of books. Uh, many of them will be The Prince itself or other publications that Machiavelli uh, wrote, uh, but you're going to have a very, very long list of books that are adaptations of Machiavelli's Prince. I keep a small collection in my office of uh, adaptations or uh, otherwise uh, uh, books inspired by Machiavelli's Prince. For example, one I have was, uh, what would Machiavelli do? Not what would Jesus do, but what would Machiavelli do? And so uh, there are so many adaptations of this book. It's one of the most uh, highly adapted books for contemporary audiences today. Clearly, it continues to enthuse people and attract them, and, and it has so much um, um, wisdom in it about worldly affairs and politics that many people find it to be inspirational. And so it's been highly adapted. I even have one version that's a children's version of the book. And so uh, it's quite shocking. I've never seen any ancient book so highly adapted uh, for modern audiences today. Uh, you can probably find at least 10 or 15 editions of the prints in print right now. So um, now, Obviously, human beings are involved in all kinds, types of different political situations, whether it's corporate politics or just you know politics on a on a social scale and so forth and so on. Many people are trying to take Machiavelli's principles and apply them there. His handbook on political power has uh, been a, a kind of a go-to book for many many centuries since it was written. However, it's been banned. It's been banished in many different places. In some cases, you could even get into deep, deep trouble for even possessing the book. Now, you may have never heard of this book, or you may have never read it, but it does deeply affect the culture that you're in by changing the practice of politics for the past 500 years. And like I said, it really began the study of modern politics by focusing on something called the realpolitik. This is political realism. It's, a, it's what really happens in the political world. Not what should happen, but what really actually takes place. So it engages what is the case, not what ought to be the case. This would be descriptive politics, not, uh, I'm sorry, descriptive politics, not prescriptive politics. Now, one precursor to this amoral turn in political uh, science was an ancient work called the Peloponnesian War, written by Thucydides. Uh, Thucydides gave us an assessment of what political leaders did during the Peloponnesian War and what were the consequences of what they did without any concern for morals, not without any concern for what they should or shouldn't do. He simply reported what they did and what happened, what worked, what didn't work. And so in a way, Machiavelli's Prince does this but distills it into a little handbook of principles for, for application. He wrote the, the Prince in 1513 and dedicated it to Lorenzo de Piero uh, de Medici, grandson of Lorenzo the Magnificent. He offers Medici this little handbook for achieving and uh, retaining raw political power 
in a volatile age in Florence, Italy. The cultural and political intrigue in Florence and larger Italian culture at that time revolved around the papal court in Rome and in Florence, at least, the power of, uh, of the Medici family. They were a very power-hungry family. <clears throat> and so there's a lot of topsy-turvy kind of back and forth, uh, chaotic uh, political upheaval in Florence. And Machiavelli is caught in the middle of this. Machiavelli wrote this political uh, pragmatic guide for two apparent reasons. First, he wanted a job. Uh, he had recently lost his job uh, due to political shifts and changes, and he wanted to be a political advisor to Lorenzo. Second, Machiavelli loved Italy and he wanted to see it unified and become a nation. Now, other nations at this time to the West had outpaced Italy and were quickly claiming vast territories around the globe. Let's think about it. What was going on in 1513? <clears throat> well, Spain uh, had already claimed and conquered much of the Americas. France, England, and Portugal had all vied for and were obtaining new far-flung territories around the globe. Where was Italy? Italy would remain frozen in a political fragmentation in an array of various political factions, city-states, papal states, tiny republics, and the like. Italy was not a nation, and it was losing out. The Holy Roman Empire to the north also suffered a very similar situation. Let me see if I can illustrate this for you. How many places in the world today speak English? A lot, right? How many places in the world speak Spanish? Yeah, a lot. Same with France, uh, France in, in French. Um, same with Portuguese. Those were the nation states that at this time were spanning out around the globe and pushing out around the globe and trying to envelop it and create colonies. Now, what about Italian? How many places in the world speak Italian? You're probably thinking uh, only Italy. Same thing with Germany. The only place in the world that people speak German really is in Germany. And so that alone illustrates the current kind of linguistic situation in the world today illustrates uh, this period that we're in. Uh, Germany, or the Holy Roman Empire, as is called at this time, in Italy, which at this time was not a nation, it was more like a, a collection of territories and uh, city-states and so forth. Uh, those two places were not unified and therefore they did not have the ability to span out around the world and to colonize the world. So Machiavelli sees this situation. Machiavelli had been a diplomat. He had gone on f some 40 different diplomatic missions at this time and he had gone all over the courts of Europe and he saw what was going on in the world. At this time, monarchs ruled the nation states of this age. Uh, these were essentially monarchies, um, uh, Spain, France, um, England. Uh, Machiavelli truly wanted Italy to be a republic, but he knew that such unity would not happen until someone could force it. So this little booklet, The Prince, aims to give Medici the practical advice to unify Italy as a nation. That unification didn't happen, not for another 350 years anyway. A very astute thinker, a Renaissance humanist, Machiavelli had served many years as a Florentine diplomat in courts all around Europe. He had studied history, a classical history, especially uh, the ancient Roman historians such as Tacitus and Livy's massive history of Rome. Machiavelli wrote another major treatise on this uh, work by Livy called Discourses on Livy. And in that book, he discusses his true Republican uh, leanings. He's an incisive observer of human nature and the pragmatics of political power. I mean, Machiavelli is the quintessential political animal. There's no one in the whole history of Western civilization who is more associated with politics and political power than Machiavelli. In fact, his very name indicates a whole approach to power. It's called Machiavellianism. If you hear someone called a Machiavellian, then you know to avoid such a person because you know that they were a very power-hungry hungry individual who is willing to follow the type of advice that's given in the prince, okay? And so the prince essentially is an all-moral guide for attaining power. 
So the Prince took on a life of its own as a revolutionary, revolutionary handbook for attaining and keeping power. It wasn't printed until 1533, six years after his death. Machiavelli never intended this book to be read by every person as a way to get ahead in life, but that's what it's become today with all these adaptations and so forth that you would see on Amazon. Okay? It contains principles that private individuals cannot practice without great moral upheaval. It's sometimes called diabolical. It was banned, heretical, dangerous. All these words summarize the great opposition to this book. It contains advice that cannot be practiced by private citizens, nor was it ever intended to do so. Uh, and Machiavelli himself never practiced these type of devious, uh, deceptive, backstabbing uh, techniques that he suggests in The Prince. All right, let's look at some of the general themes of the book itself. The Prince aims to spell out specific amoral principles of power and to give examples from history that illustrate how a particular ruler used this principle. He applies these principles to, in practical ways to solve problems that a ruler will have. So one of the techniques that Machiavelli is using <coughs> is to look back into the past and find some great ruler in the past, in Rome uh, or in Greece or uh, even in, a, in Italian uh, civilization, and then look and study their life. And he loved doing this kind of thing, looking and reading the histories and seeing what they did and how their techniques worked or didn't work. One of, one of the great examples he's going to point to that didn't work was Savonarola, which we'll discuss here in just a minute. And so he points out things that don't work and things that do work. But usually what he finds is that what works are when people approach power and politics in a completely amoral way. Okay, Machiavelli assumes that human beings are selfish, evil, and fickle. We are cantankerous uh, human lot, and our nature must be controlled through power and fear. People protect their own interests at the expense of others, and we are a very unruly lot. Now, he believes with Pico that people can choose to rise above their animal nature, but he pessimistically believes that they just don't. So, even though even though Machiavelli thoroughly believes in free will, and he's a humanist, that's one of the hallmarks of the humanist, is, the, is this belief in the free will and that you can craft yourself and make yourself. He simply believes that they don't. People are selfish and evil and wicked. And that's pretty much where he starts out, with this view of human nature. Now, like most humanists, including Pico and Erasmus that we will look at later, uh, Machiavelli believes people have free will and can choose their destiny free of divine interference. Now, Machiavelli is not an atheist. He does believe in God, and he is a Christian of a certain type. But he could probably be more easily understood as a kind of a deist. A deist would be someone who believes in a supreme being that simply doesn't interact in this world. He created this world and made us and so forth and so on, but a deist simply believes that God is no longer involved in in the affairs of this world. <clears throat> but each of these uh, thinkers that we've looked at, in their own way, try to steer uh, clear of, but usually wind up in the Pelagian heresy. And that is the idea that ultimately you can choose your way into some salvation. Machiavelli is not a theologian, and he really doesn't care too much about theology at all. Like I said, it's all about politics for him. Now. He does believe that great men rise above their circumstances, take control of chaos, take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and establish rule. Effectively running a state is for Machiavelli the greatest virtue. Why? Because this brings the greatest type of benefits to humanity. It is the greatest humanitarian quest. And so he is a humanist and he promotes humanity. So he is very pro-humanitatis. Effective statesmen will bring the highest benefits to humanity through social order, yielding peace and prosperity. However, this requires that someone at the helm, an executive power, a prince, use force to control humanity's stubborn and careless selfishness. And this prince is essentially above morality. 
are beyond morality in the sense that this prince has to use principles of action that you can't use in ordinary life every day. This is an enlightened despotism that sees the human situation is desperately in need of autocratic rule to limit the misery of humanity. The ruler must bring order to the chaos of human nature through effective social organization, but this requires power obtained through all moral methods. Power is all moral for Machiavelli. The all moral approach to power, or the moral approach to power, that is, simply does not work. Being nice doesn't work. Unarmed prophets soon die. And he saw this happen to Savonarola, who met his fate in Florence. Machiavelli says, quote, Hence it is that all armed prophets have conquered, and the unarmed ones have been destroyed. Savonarola, who was ruling with his new order of things, immediately the multitude believed in him no longer, and he had no means of keeping steadfast those who believed or of making the unbelievers to believe. So Savonarola was one of the great moral reformers of Florence. He tried to come into Florence as a preacher, as a prophet, and preach vehemently against all of the abject moral corruption that was in Florence at that day and age. Um, and he succeeded for a short period of time. He was very apocalyptic. He was saying that you know, essentially you know, Florence was going to you know, uh, burn like a Sodom and Gomorrah. Hellfire and damnation were going to rain down upon them. And so he was able to convince the people to repent. And for about three years, he was able to morally reform the city. But he got in on the bad side of a lot of the powerful people at that time, the Medici and the Pope. And eventually, they were able to overcome him. And so Savonarola's moral reform eventually uh, ended with him being uh, executed. Now, he says that ruler, Machiavelli says that rulers can only afford to be liberal and generous with other people's money, never his own. Uh, in other words, if you're going to be generous, do it with somebody else's money, okay? And this is a political principle that we see in practice all the way down to the present. Politicians love to give away other people's money and to gain and curry favor. But he says, generally, liberality leads to hatred and poverty. One simply can, cannot give away his own money as a ruler, as favors without descending slowly into poverty. Moreover, one of the problems with that whole approach is that you please very few people. You raise people's expectations of more and more and more. To avoid this, a ruler can take other people's money, either as taxes or plunder, and give it away. And so if you do tax heavily and you achieve plunder, you should give some of it away, he says. But it is going to bring about a form of hatred, he says, because the gifts will only help very few people and, but they will harm many. He says, quote, Nothing wastes so rapidly as liberality, or even while you exercise it, you lose the power to do so, and so become either poor or despised. Or else, in avoiding poverty, rapacious and hatred. And a prince should guard himself above all things against being despised and hated, and liberality leads you to both. So, being miserly and tight-fisted is a far better policy because the ruler then avoids hatred. Uh, you could be disliked because you're miserly, but at least you avoid being hated and despised. And so for Machiavelli, it's always important for the ruler, uh, for a political ruler, uh, to avoid being hated. And so we're going to see that he uses all kinds or in encourages all kinds of techniques to engender favor and bring favor to the politician at the same time while he's taking people's money or he's harming them in some other way. Okay. It is better for the ruler to be feared and loved, but if only one, fear surpasses love uh, to keep people controlled. In other words, it's great to be feared and loved, but it's very hard to stay to, uh, feared and loved. Okay. It's very difficult to maintain both. So if you have to go one way or the other, forget love and just focus on being feared. He says, quote, Every prince ought to desire to be considered clement and not cruel. 
Nevertheless, he ought to take care not to misuse this clemency. So a ruler must practice an enlightened self-interest by avoiding anything that brings hatred to him. Be feared, but never be hated. Fear keeps subjects united and faithful, but too much mercy brings disorder. He says, quote, Upon this a question arises, whether it is better to be loved than feared, or feared than loved. It may be answered that one should wish to be both, but because it is difficult to unite them in one person, it is much safer to be feared than loved. When, of the two, either must be dispensed with, men have less scruple in offending one who is beloved than one who is feared. Fear preserves you by a dread of punishment which never fails. So you can see that there's this fear in love type of balance. And if you're going to get out of balance, if you have to err in one direction or the other, err in the direction of being feared. Because love is not something that's going to keep people obeying you as a ruler, but fear will. Fear never fails, he says. So as long as you avoid hatred, rulers can rule with fear. But they must avoid hatred by keeping their hands off of people's property and off of people's women. If execution is required, that's a very good way to bring about fear, is through executions. But it must be on clear and just rational grounds. Cruelty is not optional if you're a ruler. You must be cruel. And like an amputation, cruelty prevents worse problems. So. Cruelty is something that you have to pursue, but it prevents even worse problems from taking place. So a clever ruler should seek to appear merciful, seek to appear faithful and religious, humane and upright. These are all qualities you want to uh, engender, uh, to appear to have. This is all about image management. Image greatly matters in politics. However, a ruler should never bother to actually embody these traits. You just want to appear to be faithful, not actually be faithful. Right? You're, kind of, you're kind of dumb if you are, if you uh, follow those virtues blindly. So the optics alone are what matters. The vulgar masses will follow for the image every time. He says, quote, Therefore, it is unnecessary for the prince to have all the good qualities I have enumerated, but it is very necessary to appear to have them. To have them and always observe them is injurious, and that to appear to have them is useful, to appear merciful, faithful, humane, religious, upright, and to be so, but with a mind so framed that you should require not to be so, you may be able to know how to change to the opposite. In other words, you have to know when to appear to be faithful, but really be unfaithful. And so you want to look like you're good, but you're really doing something that's evil. Okay? Now, outright deception will be necessary in politics. For Machiavelli, deception in politics is as necessary as the deception of camouflage in war. In war, deception is necessary. Military leaders deceive their opponents all the time in all kinds of ways to win. And so it is in politics. You must deceive everyone in some way or another in order to win and gain power and keep it. So the ruler must appear noble and sincere and faithful, but he must be willing to break treaties, break agreements and contracts at the opportune moment. In fact, he recommends that you make treaties just so that you can break them at the opportune moment. And so as you go through reading The Prince, you see all kinds of principles like this, the ideas of being devious, being deceptive, um, being disingenuous, but crafting an image of yourself so that people don't see that. Okay? And so it all comes down to a ruse and deception. So what are some of the conclusions that we can draw from here, from, uh, from Machiavelli's Prince? The principles that he invents here, uh, well, he doesn't really invent these principles at all, okay? 
He simply discovers them through observation. In other words, he scours history and he finds what military and political leaders do. And he simply reports on the facts and what the results were. And then he recommends using those for current situations. So he never really suggests that they be used in personal life at all. This is not a personal guidebook for, for you know, getting ahead in corporate politics. Um, throughout The Prince, Machiavelli builds a strong case from scores of historical examples from ancient times to the present to teach Lorenzo de' Medici how rulers have been able to rule the unruly, tame the wild, survive political foes, and appear like Prince Charming. He persuasively argues that the monarch operates beyond the normal rules of ethics and morality. This isn't to give the monarch license, but to use force to bring order. Only order can bring peace and prosperity, he says. If the ruler tried to operate with the normal rules of morality and decency and kindness, he would quickly be killed or reduced to ordinary powerless ranks of people. His method scours history for justifications. It appears that many rulers indeed practiced these principles that Machiavelli identifies. Yet, there's just something deeply unsettling about the whole treatise and the reason why it has such a horrible reputation and the reason why his name, Machiavelli, is associated with this type of politics. To be a Machiavellian is to be a, a very devious and evil person much like Iago in uh, Shakespeare's uh, Othello, uh, a very Machiavellian character. To set these principles uh, down in such plain language and recommend them to, to rulers is really unnerving. And so part of, part of me agrees <clears throat> that the executive power of the land must be iron-fisted to instill enough fear in people to make them behave. But another part of me recoils at the endless abuses that are justified by this stark advice to deceive and mislead the people. This type of enlightened despotism can easily wind up as just mere despotism. When we look at many of the despotisms in the world around us today, they use these type of principles. Fear is the primary tool for controlling people in a lot of regimes where there's a lot of dark oppression. And so many political leaders since Machiavelli have used such techniques to instill deep fear in people. Now, was Machiavelli a Machiavellian? Not, doesn't seem so. Nor was he an atheist. He lived no such life. He did not really put these principles into place in his own life. His true political sentiments really rested with a Republican form of the government much like the great Roman Republic that he so adored and recommended in his discourses on Livy. His actions were not commensurate with what he wrote in The Prince. He wrote this little analysis of human nature and politics to spur Medici toward unifying Italy at a time when Italy desperately needed to enter into the modern age of nation states. He hoped that it would one day do so and become a great republic, even though that was out of favor for nations at the time. What are some of the implications? Did Machiavelli reveal the wizard behind the curtain? Perhaps the world is better off now in a way because the masses now have access to The Prince, a book that was often banished, burned, and blacklisted. If everyone can see the kinds of techniques that politicians use, then perhaps we can recognize their tricks. We are enlightened ourselves and we can see and recognize the ruses when they are being played upon us. Aside from the provocative elements of the book, it anticipates a day when politics will be based on observations of human behavior and leads us toward a modern and secular political state. Machiavelli's name will forever be associated with political deviance, but perhaps we should also commend him for helping the average person to see behind the veil of political machinations so rampant today in politics.